to know about Pete? He said to me, <laughs> as I sat down, you seem a bit flat today. What do you mean I seem a bit flat? Well, flat? Not your exuberant self. You're fine now because the camera's on. <laughs> oh, there's a bit of that to it too, I suppose. Uh, I don't know. Look, as my first wife used to say, I have my moods. But let's not go there. <laughs> dear, oh dear. Welcome to the future of radio, ladies and gentlemen. On Friday, it is the future of radio. That's the live streaming that we will do from jeremycordo.com and a three-hour radio program where you can text me or you can call me on 0491 65 68 60. And I think we've got all the bugs ironed out of the telephone. I think we have, um, but let's see, I don't know. I hope you heard the program last Friday. One of my guests was the wonderful Professor Ian Plymer. He is a brilliant geologist and climate scientist. He shot down every single piece of climate change nonsense <laughs> that these People, these intellectuals, the academics, the ABC, the lefty politicians, all bang on about, all nonsense, pure and simple nonsense. Very few people have the courage to stand up there and say the things that he is saying about climate change. Basically, climate change is natural, inevitable, unavoidable. And this whole business about trying to take, what do they say? You see it on the backs of cars and fronts of houses and things. Real action on climate change. Well, what's that like? It's like standing on the veranda and baying at the moon. The climate is always changing, always has, always will. The planet is a living, breathing, changing, evolving entity, a miracle. And we must evolve and change with it. The only mistake the dinosaurs made, you know, was that they were big and they didn't think they had to change. Well, they did. Man's contribution to climate change is minuscule but regrettable. These people want to destroy society and communities and the world as we know it to achieve absolutely nothing. Exactly like the voice. It will achieve nothing. It will do nothing. Cost a lot of money though. What I really want to know deep down is why we have a government that is dedicated to nonsense and the promotion of nonsense. Climate change nonsense. Voice to parliament referendum nonsense. Why are they trying to force this rubbish upon us and at our expense? I really don't know. I don't get it. Uh, we'll get to the birthdays later. But <sighs> Sunday last, it was an interesting day. Uh, Missy the Jack Russell just walked in. <laughs> Spontaneous animals, I love it. Uh, Michael Pratt, who was a great friend of Barty Simpson, uh, and I was a friend of Barty Simpson too, because when I left Sydney in 1976, a friend of mine was Rebel Penfold Russell. And Rebel said, when I told her I was going to Adelaide, she said, oh, you'll love that. That's the most beautiful city in the world. I, I, you'll love Adelaide. And l let me give you the names of some people who will, will, will introduce themselves to you and you to the city. And, and I was very grateful for that because you arrive cold in a strange city and you think to yourself, golly. I never must, I must admit I never felt that about Adelaide. I was, uh, I was enthralled and delighted with it from the moment I, I crossed the border, I think. Anyway, Barty Simpson was a Penfold and uh, she married a Simpson. So you had these two great families, uh, the Wine family, the the Penfold family and the Simpson family, uh, who made the first, I think it was the first black and white or the first colour television set, but they made washing machines and all kinds of appliances and things. Uh, but she was just a wonderful, wonderful lady and she had uh, a, uh, 
uh, memorial service at the theatre. What was the theatre? Regal. The Regal Theatre on Kensington Road. Yeah. The old Chelsea. The old Chelsea, yeah. She took over the theatre. She. That, that's not Missy, by the way. <laughs> anyway, she took over the theatre. She died about, uh, oh, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago. 89 years of age. And she... Uh, I think when she was 87, she made this movie about her life. It was her memorial. Wonderful eccentric lady, dressed herself up as a, a fairy with a magic wand and took us all through this wonderful adventure of her life, which was full of fantastic things. Lots of sadness. She lost three of her children. Uh, and it was one stillborn baby. But none, none of the tragedies of life ever let her be less enthusiastic about life and love and adventure. Oh, golly, she played golf. She was a horse woman. She went skiing. She was an adventurous went through Africa. Yeah, it's just a wonderful woman. Anyway, I pass that on to you because, you know, we just don't make people like that anymore and I think that's so sad. But my life was richer for having known <coughs> Barty Simpson, Barty Penfold Simpson, as many, because that whole theatre was full of people, just amazing the number of people. Anyway, that was a wonderful eccentric way to spend a Sunday morning. Uh, and on the way back, um, coming up the road, there was one of those sort of, I suppose you'd call it a garage sale, really. There was a big sign on the fence saying, come on in and take what you like, everything's free. <laughs> I thought, golly, all right, let me, I'll come and have a look. <laughs> and I did. And... Uh, there were all sorts of interesting things. He, the person whose house it was, a doctor, had gone into care. And his daughter, an astrophysicist, was there on the front lawn with all his possessions. That's so sad. You know, all his possessions piled up on the front lawn, just giving things away because they didn't know what else to do with them. I don't know, I don't know. Changing of the guard, it's, it's, uh, you go along to a Scammells or Small and Whitfield and you see the same sort of thing. But anyway, I, I, I digress. I was, I was saying, I'll, I'll, um, I'll, uh, tell you about the dates later. But <laughs> one of the dates uh, that I do remember is John Law's birthday. And he was something of a, an idol of mine when I was growing up. He was a big star at 2GB and I was an office boy. He was 26, I was 16. He was born in 1935, I was born in 1945. And there on the front lawn were these, you know, books. <laughs> um, John Law's poetry. <laughs> I don't know. I. As I say, I'm a great fan of John, but I don't know that he's, I don't know, I don't know that he's Shakespeare. <laughs> but, you know, lovely. Anyway, I thought I'd bring them along, show them to you. And as I said, I will get to the dates a little bit later on. Can I get down there? Get my magic wand. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but it's ending loneliness week. <laughs> And there is an organisation called Ending Loneliness Australia. I never knew that. But I certainly didn't know there was a week dedicated to loneliness. Anyway, they have found, believe it or not, that we are lonely people. Loneliness is a major problem. Overpopulation, I would have thought, would have been a major problem, but no, 32% of the population, one person in three, complained about being lonely. 
One person in six has complained about being severely affected by loneliness. And the people most affected by loneliness are the young. Now that really surprised me. Is that because they've got their heads stuck in their mobile phone and yeah, I would think it would be. Pete's nodding his head. Yeah, it's, it's not right. People have got to get out and socialise. I just noticed on the train when I went into town, mm -hmm. everyone is looking at their phone. Yes, that's the whole that's world. Like the you know, it's, no, it's, it's, it's totally excluding the world around us. The social media and the technology, I shouldn't knock social media too much because we are honoured to present you with this court of public opinion. Uh, I don't know if you saw the expose on Four Corners. <clears throat> Four Corners tells us that there is more trouble for the big consulting firms. This time it's KPMG. Uh, you know if you follow anything that I've said over the years, I'm not a great fan of consultants. Anyway, this, this was certainly an expose, overcharging and even charging for work that was never done. Defence, the Defence Department have paid $1.8 billion over the last 10 years. The business model is apparently called land and expand. <laughs> I learn something every day. Get in, just a few affordable billing hours, and then, once you're in, expand. And from what I heard on Four Corners, Defence were charging for hours, or they were being charged for hours that were never worked on their behalf. That's a total disgrace. Invoices were being paid and never questioned, never investigated. Don't know if you saw the show, but it's just another example of who cares? It's only public money. That's your money. That's my money. That's our money. Um, the whole weekend was filled up, well, at least on the ABC anyway, with this Gama thing. The Prime Minister of Australia, Anthony Albanese, flew to Arnhem Land to open the Gama Festival, a gathering of Aboriginals from all over Australia. I'm not sure how many or what it cost or who paid. But I can guess. I'm sure these people didn't make their own way to the festival. I'm told that people had to pay $4,000 to be there. And there were quite a few senior ABC executives, I am told. I wonder why. The Prime Minister obviously had the Prime Ministerial jet. And we wouldn't begrudge him that. I don't know what cost whatever carbon footprint, deposit, etc. Who is actually paying for the Gama Festival? Or who makes money out of the Gama Festival? Which would have been a bit of a story, but that's something that no one would touch, except, of course, the court of public opinion. I don't know what's going to come out of it. I got no idea. The Prime Minister has announced the establishment of a university to be built in Arnhem Land. Now, as we all know, it's almost impossible to get Aboriginal children into primary school. How does he imagine that spending seven or eight million dollars of public money to establish an Aboriginal university in Arnhem Land, a huge wilderness, a desert, well it's a desert in the dry season anyway, we know it won't be eight million dollars, it's going to be 25 million dollars. How is that going to work? I've got no idea. But here in the Court of Public Opinion, we'll watch it over the years. I can guarantee you that. I can also guarantee you that, uh, like a lot of Aboriginal housing and buildings and schools, destroyed, neglected, abused, ignored, now, we have a Prime Minister, ladies and gentlemen, who is obsessed with looking after 3% of the population. When in actual fact, he's been elected to look after 97% of the population. It's truly bizarre. Now, I want to leave you with this, and I want to promise you that uh, we'll follow up tomorrow uh, with, with the uh, 
if we can get it from Sky News. But anyway, let me, let me, let me tell you. I don't have access to Sky News, but a friend of mine, Sue, shared a piece that Peter Credlin had on her program, which really does bell the cat. She brought to our attention the Uluru Statement from the Heart, which the Prime Minister often refers to. In fact, he says he has a framed copy of it on his office wall. He refers to it as an eloquent and simple document. Easy to read and understand. Just one page long. A one-pager. The whole thing, he says, fits on a one A4 piece of paper. And he said it many times. Peter Credlin, through Freedom of Information, decided to do some exploring and got the entire document. Yes, the entire document. Surprise, surprise. It's not one page of eloquent, persuasive, tolerant, common sense. <laughs> it is 26 pages, which would frighten the life out of any Australian if he had the opportunity to read it in full. The Prime Minister is on record many times as saying that he will implement the Uluru Statement from the Heart in full, in its entirety, set out in the document is confrontation, hatred, racism, a virtual declaration of war on white Australia, revenge, compensation. In that document, particularly pages I think 22 through to 26, you would see the significance of the voice. It will be a third chamber which will sit above the others, that is, the House of Representatives and the Senate. It will sit above Parliament as we know it today. I'm not making this up. This is true. Three percent of the population will control this country. They can't control themselves, but they believe they're in a position to control the country. They will not be able to do that without your help and my help. That is to say, we have to stand our ground and vote no. But don't take my word for it. You can go to the Sky News website. They have, I believe, published the entire 26 pages. Sue, bless her heart, is sending me by uh, at the post it, office now. Expressed my, well, she's very keen that I get this across to you. She's sending me a hard copy of it, knowing that I'm a bit of a Luddite. Now, of course, the most important thing that this throws up, really, is the duplicity of the Prime Minister. He has been shown up as a liar. This is not a one-pager. It's not benign, moderate, innocent. It is dangerous and shocking. The Prime Minister must know this, as he has been actively keeping this Uluru statement from the heart from us from the beginning. I don't know what's on that one page or on his wall. And the one page that he keeps on talking about in Parliament. Another part of the Trojan horse. <sighs> Let's not tell people what's at foot. Okay, this man professes to lead the country, to represent this country and its people, while in his heart is this 26-page document, which he pledges over and over again to implement in full what does that tell you about the man? Beyond belief. Totally. For me, anyway. <clears throat> Let me run through a few birthdays because we're going to run out of time. 
No, we have run out of time. <laughs> but listen, tomorrow, what, what can, Pete, can we put the whole thing that Peter Credlin did on Sky News on this? Yes. We'll, we'll build tomorrow's episode of the Court of Public Opinion around that Peter Credlin broadcast. I want you to see it, because all I gave you there was a, a bit of what I could remember. Yes, I mentioned John Laws. Happy birthday, John Laws. He will be 88. 88. Uh, 1974, US President Richard Nixon announces he will resign at 12 p.m. the next day. 2022, Olivia Newton-John, British Australian Grammy Award winning pop singer, hopelessly devoted to you, physical actress, Greece. I really liked her earlier work, things like um, On the Banks of the Ohio, things like that. Dies of cancer at 33, sorry, 73, breast cancer. Uh, Pete, Smith & Wesson patent the metal bullet cartridge on this day in 1854. I didn't know that. I didn't know that either. That's great. That is great. Esther Williams, American swimmer and actress, dangerous when wet, <laughs> I'll bet, <laughs> born in Inglewood, California, she died in 2013, had a long life, born in 1921. Glenn Campbell, the American award-winning country pop singer, by the time I get to Phoenix, switcher to lineman, rhinestone cowboy, he was, a, he was a, a session musician to begin with. He used to work with the Beach Boys back in the early days. And the Monkees. And Phil Spector. Glenn Campbell, he had a television program. Had a few brushes with the law. <laughs> anyway, he, um, he was a movie star too. I think he had, what was the movie he was in, Pete? True Grit or? No, oh, I'm not sure. Rhinestone Cowboy. Rhinestone Cowboy. I don't think that was a movie. That was a song. Yeah, no. Oh, well, anyway, he was 81 when he died, so he had a good life. I, 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 I don't think I'll be saying that in a few years when I'm 81. <laughs> now, you hang on to life, don't you? That's the truth. 1945, the US, the USSR, Britain and France, sign a treaty, the Treaty of London, which sets down procedures for the Nuremberg War Trials of Nazi leaders. The great train robbery in England, $2.6 million, 1963. Um, the first known ascent of a hot air balloon in 1709. And in 1929, on the same day, the German airship Graf Zeppelin begins a round the world flight. Dustin Hoffman, American actor, the graduate, Tutsi Kramer versus Kramer, born in Los Angeles in 1937. Dino De Laurentiis, the film producer, the Italian film producer. King Kong, born in Italy, died 2010, born in Italy in 1919. Walt Disney, he announces that his company plans to create its own streaming service, cancelling links with Netflix. Itsy Bitsy Teeny Weeny Yellow Polka Dot Bikini was the number one best-selling single in our city on this day in 1960. And a bit before that, in 1876, Thomas Edison is granted a patent for his autographic printing machine. U.S. patent number 180857. Wow. Oh. Missy, do you want to come and get your ball? Do you want to come and hop up here? Say goodbye to everyone. I couldn't agree more. Oh, couldn't agree more. <laughs> She's now talking like Mr. Ed. <laughs> I, love <laughs> I love you too. Thank you so much for being with us. I'm Jeremy Cordo. Peter Clayton and I will be back tomorrow. Here in the Court of Public Opinion, don't forget our live streaming, our live broadcast on Friday between 9 o'clock and 12. You just go to Jeremy Cordo. Came to get a ball. JeremyGordo.com. Bless you. Thank you for your support. We'll see you tomorrow.